Now, we're talking about uh, the reliability of the Bible, in this case, the Old Testament, so-called Hebrew Bible. What do the scrolls contain? A lot of people uh, don't uh, want to go into it, a lot of detail, but it's important to know what it actually says and to verify how little difference it is a thousand years earlier to the text that we have manuscript evidences in the first one later. It will not be possible here to survey the more than 800 manuscripts represented by the scrolls. The following is a sample of the texts that have been studied for the last 40 years, including most of the older works on which the scrolls were based and the recently published texts from the K4. These texts can be grouped in categories, biblical text, biblical commentaries, sectarian texts, and pseudo graphical texts, apocalyptic texts, and mystical or ritualistic texts. Well, Dead Sea Scroll Discoveries Cave 1 was discovered by the Arab shepherd boy. From it, he took seven or more, more or less, complete scrolls and some fragments. And so, the story goes, he, his uh, father or uh, adults came around and said, well, let's rip it all up into small fragments uh, rather than sell one scroll, we'll make more money. Whew. Anyway. Isaiah A. St. Mark's Monastery Isaiah Scroll is a popular copy with numerous corrections above the line of in the margin. It is the earliest known copy of any complete book of the Bible. And Isaiah B. The Hebrew University Isaiah is incomplete, but its text agrees more closely with the Masoretic text than does Isaiah A. Other cave one fragments. This cave also yielded fragments of Genesis, Leviticus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Judges, Samuel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Psalms, and some non-biblical works, such, including Enoch, sayings of Moses, previously unknown, Book of Jubilee, Book of Noah, Testify, Testament of Levi, Tobit, and the Wisdom of Solomon, an interesting fragment of Daniel, containing uh, Daniel 2.4, where the language changes from Hebrew to Aramaic, also comes from this cave. Fragmentary commentaries on the Psalms, Micah, Zephaniah, were also found in Cave 1. A whole plethora. So they could gauge how accurate these copies were and how it's been transmitted. Cave 2. Cave 2 was discovered, first discovered in Pilford by the Bedouins. It was evac excavated in 1952. Fragments of about 100 manuscripts, including two of Exodus, one of Leviticus, four of Numbers, two or three of Deuteronomy, one each of Jeremiah, Job, and the Psalms, and two of Ruth were found. We have K4, Partridge K, or K4, after being ransacked by Bedouins, was searched in September 52 and proved to be the most productive cave of all. Literally thousands of fragments were recovered by purchase from the Bedouins. Now they took these manuscripts and ripped them up to this, make more money by selling pieces. And it took a long time to figure out how those pieces went together, or by the archaeologists sifting the dust in the floor of the cave. These scraps represent hundreds of manuscripts, nearly 400 of which have been identified. They include 100 copies of Bible books and all of the Old Testament except Esther. Amazing. A fragment of Samuel from K4 is thought to be the oldest known piece of Biblical Hebrew. It dates from the 3rd century BC. Also found were a few fragments of commentaries of the Psalms, Isaiah, and Nahum. The entire collection of K4 is believed to represent the scope of the Qumran Library and judging from the relative number of books found, their favorite books seem to be Deuteronomy, Isaiah, the Psalms, Minor Prophets, and Jeremiah in that order. In one fragment containing some of Daniel 7.28 and 8.1, the language changes from Aramaic to Hebrew. We have Caves 7 to 10. They, these Caves 7 to 10, examined in 1955, produced no significant Old Testament manuscripts. 
guess I can put a T in there. Cave 7 did, however, yield some disputed manuscript fragments that have been identified by Jose O'Callaghan as New Testament portions. If so, they would be the oldest New Testament manuscripts dating from as early as 80, 50, or 60. Cave 11. This cave was excavated in early 1956. It produced a well-preserved copy of 36 Psalms plus the apocryphal Psalm 151, previously known only in the Greek text, a very fine scroll of part of Leviticus, some large pieces of an apocalypse of the New Jerusalem and an Aramaic Targum, paraphrase, of Job were discovered. Several recent studies of the Dead Sea Scrolls provided detailed descriptions and inventories. Gleason L. Archer, Jr. provides an appendix to his survey of Old Testament introduction. We have a chart here. You can take a look at it. Um, just a, an accounting of it. An amazing amount of material. And basically, I say, what have we discovered with these Dead Sea Scrolls? Nothing new. They go way back, earlier, much earlier than what we had at the time in, uh, was it, 1948. Uh, and it verifies the transmission of the text remarkably, almost supernaturally well, although God allowed for human error. And yet, he, uh, he had a number of people who were just so diligent about making sure that they were transmitted properly that they're, virtually we have what was originally written. Marabat, Marabat discoveries. Prompted by the profitable finds as Qumran, the Bedouins pursued their search and found caves southeast of Bethlehem that produced self-dated manuscripts and documents for the Second Jewish Revolt, systematic exploration and excavation of these caves began in January 52. The later dated manuscripts helped establish the antiquity of the Dead Sea Scrolls. From these caves came another scroll of the Minor Prophets, the last half of Joel through Haggai, that closely supports the Masoretic text. The oldest known Semitic papyrus of Paulin Palimpsest inscribed the second time in the ancient Hebrew script, dating from the 7th, 8th centuries B.C., was found there. So we had, they had, and we still have with these manuscripts all over the world, uh, the ancient Hebrew text from which the Masoretes uh, used sources or were able to compare, and we find hardly any significance as the transmission from one century to the next. The significance of the Qumran documents to textual criticism can be seen in the following perspectives from Old Testament scholars. First and foremost, the Dead Sea Scrolls take the textual scholar back about 1,000 years earlier than previously known Hebrew manuscript evidence. Prior to the Qumran discoveries, the earliest complete copies of Old Testament books dated from about the early 10th century AD. The earliest co complete copy of the entire Old Testament dated from the early 20 11th century A.D. The Dead Sea manuscripts thus gives much earlier evidence for the text of the Old Testament than anything previously known. Prior to the discovery of the scrolls at Qumran, the oldest extant manuscripts were dated from approximately A.D. 900. Some manuscripts of the Dead Sea scrolls, which included copies of Isaiah, Habakkuk, and others, were dated back 125 BC, providing manuscripts 1,000 years older than previously available. The major conclusion was that there was no significant difference between the Isaiah scroll at Qumran and the Masoretic Hebrew text dated 1,000 years earlier or later. This confirmed the reliability of our present Hebrew text. Together with the extent, extent material, they, the Dead Sea Scrolls, will do, will do much to extend the frontiers of knowledge in the history of history, in the history of areas of history, religion, and sacred literature. There can be no doubt that the Dead Sea Scrolls have ushered in a new era of biblical study in which that was known to be, will be con confirmed. So far we haven't found anything better. In conclusion, we should accord to the Masoretes the highest praise for their meticulous care in preserving so sedulously the continental text of the Sopharum which had been entrusted to them. They, together with the Sopharum themselves, gave the most diligent attention to accurate preservation of the Hebrew scriptures 
that has ever been devoted to any ancient literature, secular or religious, in the history of human civilization. So conscientious were they in their stewardship of the holy text that they did not even venture to make the most obvious corrections, so far as the consonants were concerned, but left their borlage exactly as it had been handed down to them. So they know what they corrected, what they found an error, they left the error in and they made corrections. So you can see both. Because of their faithfulness, we have today a form of the Hebrew text, which in all essentials duplicates the recension which was considered authoritative in the days of Christ and the apostles, if not a century, century earlier. Remember, in uh, about 1000 AD, a little bit before that, the Masoretes converted the vocabulary and the letters uh, to something more amenable so that it could be uh, last and last longer. Uh, so they had the ancient Hebrew, and then they converted over to something more reliable as far as the linguistic format is concerned. And this, in turn, judging from Qumran evidence, goes back to an authoritative revision of the Old Testament text, which was drawn up on the basis of the most reliable manuscripts available for collation from previous centuries. These bring us very close in all essentials to the original autographs themselves and furnish us with an authentic record of God's revelation. Conclusion. Check against the Dead Sea Scroll. With the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, scholars of Hebrew manuscripts dated 1,000 years earlier than the great Masoretic text manuscripts, enabling them to check the fidelity of the Hebrew text. There is a word-for-word -word identity in more than 95% of the cases, and the 5% variation consists mostly of slips of the pen and spelling. The Isaiah Scroll, 1Q1SA, from Qumran led the Revised Standard Version translators to make up, make only 13 changes for the Masoretic text. Eight of those were known from, from ancient versions, and few were significant. Of the 166 Hebrew words in Isaiah 53, only 17 Hebrew letters in the Isaiah B scroll differ from the Masoretic text. Ten letters are a matter of spelling, four are stylistic changes, and the other three compose the word for light, in which, which does not affect the meaning greatly. Furthermore, that word is also found in the same verse in the Septuagint and, the, and in the Isaiah A scroll. Non-Hebrew manuscript evidence. The various ancient translations called versions of the Old Testament provide the textual scholar with very valuable witnesses to the text. Very often, some, uh, sometimes I have found that they are the more accurate in the rendering because it was uh, uh, 3rd century B.C. The Septuagint, LXX, for example, preserves a textual tradition from the 3rd century B.C. These and the Masoretic text provide three Old Testament textual traditions that, when critically evaluated, supply an overwhelming support for the integrity of the Old Testament text. The witness of the Samaritan Pentateuch, and especially that of the Septuagint, with its revisions and recensions, is a major confirmation of the textual integrity often uh, valuable in confirming points, uh, historical ones especially. Just as the Jews had abandoned their native Hebrew tongue for Aramaic in the Near East, so they abandoned the Aramaic in favor of Greek in such Hellenistic centers as Alexandria, Egypt. During the campaigns of Alexander the Great, the Jews were shown considerable favor. In fact, Alexander was sympathetic toward the Jews as a result of their policies toward him in the siege of Tyre. He is even reported to have traveled to Jerusalem to pay homage to their God. As he conquered new lands, he built new cities that frequently included Jewish inhabitants and often named them Alexandria. Because the Jews were scattered from their homeland, there was a need for the scriptures in the common language of the day. The name Septuagint, meaning 70, and usually abbreviated by the use of the Roman numerals LXX, was given to the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures during the reign of King Ptolemy of Philadelphia of Egypt. F. F. Bruce offers an interesting rendering of the origin of the name for this translation concerning a letter purporting to be written around 250 B.C. Let me fix that spelling error there. More realistic a short time before 100 B.C. By Aristius, a court official of King Ptolemy, to his brother 
Philocrates. Bruce writes, 